two favorites to start with this afternoon, and we'll start with uh, number 423, 423, Joy to the World, number 423. pages over our next favorite is number 427 and uh, as I drive into the church parking lot I'm wondering how many of you think of this song when you see those three figures wrapped in burlap beside the gate <laughs> number 427 we three kings of Orient are
to admit, I have never looked at those three trees and thought about the three uh, wise men, but uh, we will from now on. Again, we're glad that you're here. I mentioned in our service this morning our newest missionaries, Thomas and Angie Castellaw. They, of course, have gone to the northern shore of Hawaii. We just received this email from them, and they said this, We have kept ourselves busy each day. We're trying to get established in our errand running. We've been careful to leave gospel tracts, witnesses, and where appropriate plans of our future intentions. To our amazement, on the North Shore, where we intend to set roots, nearly everyone has responded with interest. We met a lady that was selling softball-sized avocados down the street from our future place. After just a few sentences, her accent gave her away. Sure enough, she was just hours away from Heidelberg, Germany. She, in typical German form and fashion, said she doesn't know what a Baptist is. Well, here, read a gospel tract from our church so you can find out. Another visitor from India asked Angie, visitor or resident? Angie said, we moved here to start a church. The lady responded, I have some Christian friends, but I don't know how church works. So Angie was able to give her a full gospel presentation. Please pray for those needs. As far as a place to meet, we're in escrow right now to buy a one-acre property with a small 880 square feet parsonage. In the back, we have enough room for us to set up a 30 by 45 commercial tent. This tent will facilitate a gathering area for Bible studies and fellowship until the church is formed. And he writes this, the tent will cost us $6,020 plus shipping. We've ordered it by faith. If any church or individual would like to help us buy it, we'd be extremely grateful. Again, that's the newest missionaries that we've taken on going to the country of, or the uh, rather the state of Hawaii. Continue praying for them. And again, it may be that uh, we could have a part in the purchase of that tent. Uh, keep praying, if you would, for a number of our folks that are not completely well. Pray for Carlene Wamsley. Also pray for Rosa, for Karam, for Niles, for Roy. Pray, if you would, for Nadine's dad, Kevin. He has been taking uh, medicine, pretty strong medicine, to deal with pneumonia that he is battling. And uh, continue to pray for all 59 of our missionary families, that the Lord would help them. A number of them are back in North America, waiting for their country on the foreign field to open up, and they're sure anxious to get there. Pray, if you would, for them. Also, continue to pray 25 independent Baptist churches across our country without a pastor. How we need to pray that God will provide. Pray for our, some of our people. A few have been laid off of work. A few, their work hours have been cut back. Some of our people with businesses hurting just a bit because of all these restrictions. And now we need to pray that God will bless them. And let's continue to pray for our government as they make decisions that affect so many. And of course, our greatest concern is the spiritual needs of people. And now we need to pray that the decisions that our governments make helps the spiritual condition of people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we are thankful for your help, for your answers to prayer, for your direction this last week. And Lord, I pray that you would prepare us for these days ahead. Father, again, we bring the needs of some of these that have health issues. Lord, we pray that you'd meet their needs, encourage them. Father, we pray about this newsletter we just read from the cast laws in Hawaii. Lord, we pray that you would provide the funds that they need to purchase a tent, that they can set up on their property, begin to hold Bible studies and services. Father, we ask that you'd help in that need. Again, help any of our people traveling, help these churches across our country without pastors, direct the right men to the, be the leadership there. And Lord, we just pray that you'd guide our government. Lord, we don't claim to understand all that's happening. All we can do is trust you. Lord, we pray that they would look to you for the wisdom that they need in the decisions that they make. Again, help us tonight. Encourage our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing another song. For one more Christmas carol, let's turn to number 434. 
434, O Little Town of Bethlehem, number 434. our regular service just a bit. You know that tonight is a night that we have our Bible trivia contest. 55 questions. Trust that you're looking forward to that. We did make uh, blank copies for the answers available to our people. I know that some of you that have phones that you can uh, put in your answer through a Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T, uh, website program on there. And so we'll give you more details and we'll also give you the pin to access that just before we start the game. But again, I know that many of our people are involved in the Bible reading program. If you have, you're almost done for another year. And God bless you for your faithfulness. The present year is a green one. And uh, if you get that done, once you get it done, if you'd somehow get us to see it, maybe the easiest way for you with phones is to take a picture of the inside, the outside, text those pictures if you would to Pam Lowen. Otherwise, if uh, you're not able to do it that way, if you could either show it to Mrs. Lowen or show it to myself or my wife again, once you're finished the year, if you could somehow let us see that. Also, the brand new Bible reading program for next year, 2021, yellow in color. Many of our people have already been handed these, and we are just trying to encourage our people to be faithful in the reading uh, of the Word of God. And so if you would keep up with that, that'd be great. I've been handed a note, parking lot, 19 vehicles in our parking lot, front and back, 47 people. And again, just with a little bit of snow blowing, we appreciate the faithfulness of each one that's here. As far as uh, issues coming up, um, this coming week, Tuesday night, of course, the teaching of our Bible Institute is all done for the semester but we do have students that are still writing exams. And if you'd pray for them, if you are planning to write an exam this Tuesday at six o'clock, if you could just let us know Monday so that we know how many are coming. We don't have a Wednesday night service. We encourage you to get your family together and if, uh, get on the internet, find a Bible preaching service. Be encouraged. There are so many good churches that are preaching the word of God 
we encourage you to do that for Wednesday night. Of course, Friday is Christmas. And uh, if I don't see you before then, Merry Christmas. God bless you. I trust that you will take time to remember that day is about the day that Jesus came to this earth to uh, live and then to die for our sins. Was it December 25th? Probably not. But again, it's good to be reminded of what Jesus has done. And again, next Sunday, we have services 1030 in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. As far as birthdays, we have one birthday this week. Christian Sarmiento has a birthday tomorrow. I believe their family's in our parking lot. He turns 17 tomorrow. Happy birthday, Christian. We are going to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Many of our people have set it up with their bank that they can do Interact e-transfer. And God bless you for your faithfulness in giving. Others just make a point putting the offering in an envelope, dropping it by during the week. And either way, it will get to the work of God. Again, if you'd please listen as our offertory is being played. Take your hymn books again, please, and turn with me to number 303, 303, and we'll sing My Faith Looks Up to Thee, number 303.
It is time for preaching. If you'd take your Bibles tonight, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Again, tonight is when we're having our Bible trivia contest. We've done this for many years on a Sunday night in December. And yet we're going to look at the Bible just for a few minutes, a shorter message tonight. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Now around here, if you've attended our church for any length of time, you know that the Bible is always a big deal. We call ourselves Bible-believing Christians. We call ourselves Bible-practicing Christians. We call ourselves a Bible-believing Baptist church. And maybe the question comes up, why should the Bible be so important in our lives? And so we're going to look just a few minutes at that before we look at our contest tonight. And I'd like you to begin 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'd like to read just verse 16. Again, very familiar verse to we who are readers of the Bible every day, every day, every day. 2 Timothy 3.16, if you'd follow as I read. The Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we're thankful for the service, thankfulness for, uh, thankful for the faithfulness of so many that have gathered, some in their homes, some here in our parking lot, and Lord, just a handful here in the building. Lord, we appreciate the faithfulness of your people. And Lord, as we look into this very common subject on the Bible, we're going to try to answer this afternoon, why is it? that the Bible should be so important in our lives. Teach us. Maybe some of this will be a reminder. Maybe something said will be new. And Lord, either the case, if it helps us to continue to faithfully read your word, it will have been wisely invested. Help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, 2 Timothy. It's a book that Paul wrote. And Paul wrote it to a young man that he had trained, Timothy. Timothy had been his understudy for about 10 years. And by this time, Timothy has launched out. He's become the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Paul is now writing the very last letter that Paul ever wrote. And he's writing it to this uh, young man that he taught. And he's trying to remind Timothy, when we come to chapter 3, of the importance of the Word of God in Timothy's life. Just a minute. By this time, he's a pastor. By this time, he's had all his training. Surely, this young man has come to the place where he could now set aside the Bible and go on into studies of other things. No, no. Paul said, Timothy, the Bible is still important in your life. And most of you know, uh, the past number of years, that uh, we've had this Bible trivia contest. We're doing it tonight. But just before we do, why should the Bible be so important in our lives? I'd like to believe that many of the people in our church have a daily habit of reading the Bible. And if that describes you, then you know that this is an incredible book. It's not like you can read it one time and you've got it all figured out. You need to read it and read it again and read it again. Do you know if that describes you, then you know that God blesses a Bible-reading Christian. And yet, if you read your Bible every day, could I say to you that you're in a minority? I was looking at statistics, and these would be U.S. statistics. And, uh, but just recently, 2018, 2019, and they asked the question, how often do you read the Bible? Do you know that there were 30% of people that said they had never once in their entire life read the Bible. 30%. On the other extreme, there were 15% that said they read it every day, every day, every day. I trust that you're in that everyday category. They say, well, preacher, 30% and 15%, well, that's pretty close. Well, hold on, we haven't added up this other side yet. 30% said they had never once in their life read the Bible. Added to that, 11 more percent said they only read the Bible once every year. That's 41% now. 
The next one said that they read the Bible once or twice in a year. We're now up to 49% of people that were polled said at most they had ever read the Bible was once or twice a year. Folks, that's half. Half of the people that were uh, checked and interviewed and questioned, basically the Bible is not important in their life. When they went a little bit further, 6% said they read it maybe three or four times a year. Six more percent said maybe once a month. 9% said, you know, I probably read the Bible once a week. I'm curious how many of those, when they read it once a week, it's just in a church service that they attend Sunday morning, and the pastor tells them to open up the Bible. Do you understand that we are now up to 70% of people who really the Bible is not very important? Over here on the other side, 15%. Every day, every day, every day. And to that, you could add another... 13% that said two or three times a week at the most. You understand if to you Bible reading is important, you're in a minority. You're in a very small crowd. Okay, Pastor, why? Why should the reading of the Bible be so important in my life? Let's look at some reasons in our text. Look there in verse number 16. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. If you're taking notes tonight, the first reason that this Bible ought to be important to you is it's God's personal book. It's, it is God's personal book. Now, just think about this. The God who created this universe, the God who created this world, the God who formed the planets and the stars, the God who formed the mountains and the valleys, the God who formed the oceans and the rivers, the God who formed the trees and the animals, after God made all of those things, then God's crowning achievement was making Adam and Eve and mankind. That same God who was powerful enough to do all of those things, that God wrote a book. And that book is the Bible. And that book tells us all that we need to know about him. And that book gives his direction in our lives. I see the first reason that the Bible ought to be so important in your life is it's God's personal book. He wrote it. Now, quite honestly, I've never written a book in my life. I know that I've written many notes for Bible Institute classes. I know that we have 20-plus pastors and missionaries around the world that use that material But I've never uh, written a book in my life. But if I had written a book, it would be your choice whether to read it or not read it. If you have written a book, it would be my choice whether to read it or not read it. And quite honestly, if I decided not to read your book or you decided not to read my book, you might not be out very much. You might be able to get that same information in another book I'm saying to you, if you missed reading somebody else's book, that might not be that big of a deal. But you know the God that created all things, he wrote one book. You would be at a great loss if you never read God's book. I know some people that have read a book every every day of their life. And you know, if you read a book every day of your life, the world would likely consider you to be wise and learned. But you know, if you didn't read this Bible every day of your life, in God's estimation, you'd be anything but wise and learned. Do You know, we know that skeptics like to say of this Bible, oh, it was just written by men. That's their opinion of the Bible. And yet, as much as we know that it was men that held the pen in their hand and wrote those words, it was God that directed those men exactly what to write. Look here again at verse 16. The Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means God breathed. God literally breathed into the minds of the authors of this Bible what to write, how to write it word for word. 
That's how this Bible came into being. It wasn't just written by men. This Bible, in fact, is the words of God. If you uh, keep your hand there in 2 Timothy real quickly, turn to 2 Peter chapter number 1. Just a few books after 2 Timothy. We come to Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. Look there in 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, what I'm trying to say to you is the first reason that this Bible ought to be so important in your life is it's God's personal book. Look there in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Understand, he's saying we didn't get the Scriptures because a man willed it to happen. Again, verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They did not write these things on their own accord. God told them exactly what to write. You know, I checked it today. There are 130 million different books that have ever been written. I don't know how someone would come to that conclusion, but 130 million books have been written over 6,000 years of time. But you know, there was only one book written by God. And if you read all the rest that this world wrote, but never read the book that God wrote, you'd be at a tremendous loss. Back there to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Again, I say to you, why should the Bible be of so important in our lives? First of all, because it's God's personal book. Can I give you a second reason? Look there in verse number 16 again. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Do you know as much as we believe that the Bible is not the words of men, but that it's the words of God? Did you know the word Bible is not found anywhere in the Bible? You won't find that word Bible in our Bible. It's called a number of things. Sometimes it's called the Word of God. Hebrews 4 and verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Sometimes this Bible is called the Word. Forever, O Lord, thy Word is settled in heaven. Sometimes this Bible is called thy statutes and thy precepts and thy testimonies and thy judgments and thy commandments throughout the book of Psalms, particularly in Psalm 119. David repeatedly used those titles for the Bible. But I want you to look closely at the word that Paul used to explain this Bible. Verse number 16, it says, for all Scripture. Paul used the word Scripture. And you know that Scripture that Paul talked about, that word is used 53 times in the Old Testament and New. That word Scripture is describing this book that God breathed. But I want you to back up just a verse there, if you would, to verse 15. I want you to look at the adjective that's used to describe this scripture. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul said to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Do you understand that holy, word holy means sacred? That word holy means pure. It means set apart. It means divine. The word holy means unsoiled, without fault, without stain. It means sinless. It means perfect. You know, the second reason that you ought to read the Word of God, it's because it's the only perfect book. It's the only perfect book. I said to you already that 130 million books have been written by men and women across 6,000 years. But you know that none of them are perfect books, they all have errors. They all have mistakes. They all have grammar problems and spelling problems and punctuation problems. Or they have content problems. None of the 130 million books that mankind has written are perfect. 
There is only one perfect book to be found in this world, and that's the Bible. Now, why would you spend time reading imperfect books and not take time to read the only perfect book? You might have good books in your library, just like I have good books in mine. But good books still have errors. Good books still have mistakes. This book, God's Word, has no mistakes, no errors, no oops, no unfortunate renderings. It's perfect. Pastor, why is it that the Bible should be so important in our lives? First of all, it's God's personal book. Secondly, it's the only perfect book. Could I give you a third reason? Look there, if you would, in verse 15. Paul, speaking to Timothy, now a pastor at Ephesus, he said in that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, there's a third reason why this Bible ought to be important in your life. And that, that's because this Bible will point you the way to get to heaven. This Bible will point you the way to get to heaven. Look again at verse 15. Paul said to Timothy, "In that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, if we stop ten people on the street today, and if we ask ten people, what does a person need to do to get to heaven? We might get ten different answers. Some would say attend a church. Some would say, well, you need to get water baptized. Some would say, you know what, if you live by the golden rule. Some would say, if you give money to charity. Some would say, I think to get to heaven, you have to keep the sacraments. Some would say, no, no, if you just pray to the saints, you'll get there. Some will say, just don't murder anyone. Others will say, well, why don't you just live a good life? You and I that know the Bible know that there are none of those things that will get someone to heaven. You say, preacher, if they won't, how does a person get to heaven? The Bible makes that very clear. The Bible said, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you read your Bible, you find Jesus is the only way. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Titus chapter 3, and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Preacher, why should the Bible be so important in our lives? The third reason is it'll point you the way to heaven. Do you know there are many people that felt that they are, were on their way to heaven until they picked up a Bible and they started reading it? I think that many of you would recognize the name Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a great reformer back in the 1400s and 1500s. And God used Martin Luther to break the bondage that people in that day were under religion and specifically under the hold of the Roman Catholic Church. While Martin Luther wasn't born with that understanding, Martin Luther was raised in the Roman Catholic Church first as a monk and then as a priest, and he was very dedicated to his religion. He believed that by being dedicated to his religion that he'd get to heaven. Well, you know, Martin Luther's testimony was he began to read the Bible. And as he read the Bible, God opened his eyes to the truth that it's not by our works, but he read over there in Romans and again in Hebrews, he read that the just shall live by faith. And the Bible opened his understanding in how a person really gets to heaven. Preacher, why should the Bible be so important? First of all, it is God's personal book. Secondly, it's because it's the only perfect book. Third, because it'll point you the way to heaven. I give you a fourth thing here in verse 16 again. 
Verse 16, for all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You know the fourth reason? It will always profit you. You know, there are many things that we can get involved in. Many activities that we can be engaged in. And a lot of times when we're done that activity, we kind of look back and say, that was a waste. <laughs> Maybe we invested in some particular stock only a few weeks later to get out and almost lose our shirt by getting out. That was a waste. Put our energies in some kind of a construction project only to find out the wind blew it over last night. That was a waste. But you know you will never waste your time reading the Word of God if your heart is open and your mind is searching. There will never be a time where you have wasted your time in the scriptures. You say, Pastor, sometimes I've read the Bible and I don't think it did anything for me. Well, look there and again in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, and then he gives four different ways it profits. First of all, for doctrine. Do you know doctrine is teaching us what's right? And sometimes when you read the Bible, it confirms what God says is right. Second thing we read, they're profitable for doctrine, for reproof, or reproof is teaching us what's wrong. Sometimes as we read the Bible, God opens our eyes to understand what's wrong, what we shouldn't be a part of. The third thing, it says for correction. And correction is how to fix when we're doing something. It's one thing to know that it's wrong. Hey, how do I fix it? That's that word correction. Finally, the fourth word there is instruction. And instruction is simply how to get us to do what's right. Do you know, as you read the Bible, and if you approach that Bible, Lord, this is your book. It's a perfect book. It was this book that showed me how to get to heaven. But Lord, I need your help today. Please guide me. I say to you the fourth reason, it will always profit you. And then could I give you the fifth reason, and this would be my last, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17. The Bible says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know, not only the Bible will help you, it'll show you the way to heaven, it'll help you to understand God and God's will for your life, but notice it will equip you throughly, it will furnish you throughly. That word throughly means completely. It means it will give you everything that you need but notice, God is not interested in you reading the Bible just to give you everything you need. Look there at the last part of verse 17. Unto all good works. Do you know as you read the Bible, as I read the Bible, as God furnishes us, as God equips us, then the Spirit of God will take those truths in us and cause us to get out there and do something for the Lord. That's why it ends, verse 17, unto all good works. David used that word truly, and David said, wash me truly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. When David used that word truly, he talked about completely, not just a bit here and a bit there, completely. And here Paul says in verse number 17, as you read the Bible, Timothy, it will equip you, it will truly furnish you so that then you are able to get out there and do great works for the Lord Jesus Christ. Preacher, I used to read the Bible. Well, I don't read it anymore. I just don't get anything out of it. You know, many years ago, there was a great evangelist. His name was Gypsy Smith. And a man came up to him one day and he said, you know what, I've gone through the Bible several times. It didn't do anything for me. And Gypsy Smith responded and said, oh, you can go through the Bible as many times as you want. You have to let the Bible go through you for it to make a difference. And could I suggest to us, God bless you if every day, every day, every day you read the Bible. But before you start, would you bow your head and say, Lord, this is a spiritual book. And only you can open my eyes to understand it. 
And Father, I pray that you would help it to make a difference in my life so that I can make a difference for you in people's lives. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as the piano begins to play this song, an old-fashioned song, Break Thou the Bread of Life, Dear Lord to me, As Thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, Beyond the sacred page, I seek Thee, Lord, My spirit pants for Thee, O living Word. Is the Bible precious to you? Is the Bible real to you? If it's not, the fault doesn't lay in God's Word. The fault somewhere lays in your heart and mine. As this song is played one more verse, this should be your prayer every time you open God's Word. Break thou the bread of life. Father, we thank you for the wonderful truth after all that you created, after all that you made, then you handed mankind a book. It's your book. It's the only book that you wrote. It's a perfect book. It's the book that can point us the road to heaven. It's the book, Lord, that can profit in every area of our life. But it's the book that will equip us, not just that we can show people what we know, but that we can turn around and help people, those not saved to get saved, those not living for Jesus to live for Jesus. Lord, would you help us? May the Bible be precious. Maybe someone used to read the Bible and stopped. May their desire and their determination to be get back in the Word of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to have Brother Mickey come and lead his song. But for you that are trying to get on your phone for the Kahoot game, K-A-H-O-O-T, if you would get on that website, it's called Kahoot. Sometimes you need Kahoot.it. But you're going to need a PIN number. And so I'm about to give you the PIN number. You'll need to type that in. And then it'll ask for your nickname. If you'd put your real name, that would help us because we're going to have a listing here of who's first place, second place, third place, and then you have to hit OK or go on or something like that, Then you want to wait for the questions. This is the PIN number that you need, 0687221. I'll read that again, 0687221. One more time, 0687221. And then two, one again. If you uh, don't have that in the phone, we handed out some blank forms for the trivia answers. Make sure your name's at the top. We're going to sing one song, then get into the questions. Open your hymn books one more time and turn to number 359. 359, thy word have I hid in my heart, number 359. is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path away, to guide and to save me from sin, and show me the heavenly way. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee, that I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. Ever, O Lord, is thy word established and fixed on high. Thy faithfulness unto all men abideth forever nigh. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might know.
not sin against thee. That I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. At morning, at noon, and at night, I ever will give thee praise. For thou art my portion, O Lord, and shall be through all my days. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. That I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. Through him whom thy word hath foretold, the Savior and morning star, salvation and peace have been brought to those who have strayed afar. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee, that I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. Okay, we're sure glad you're here. I hope you're all ready. Do you have your blank sheet or your phone ready? We're up to question number one. Again, if you're writing this on a piece of paper or a blank piece of paper, make sure that your name is at the top and uh, circle one of the answers. Again, I think that this is such an easy quiz. You probably are going to be able to root out the wrong ones and you're only left with one. Let's begin with question number one. Question number one is, and these first five questions are about creation. First question, in how many days did God create the heaven and the earth? Either four days, five days, six days, or seven days. Pick your answer. In how many days did God create the heaven and the earth? Four or five or six or seven? We're looking for answers there. Still waiting. Here we go. Question number two. Question number two. What was created the same day as Adam? Was it the Garden of Eden? Was it land animals? Was it sky animals? Was it water animals? Again, what was created the same day as Adam? Pick your answer. Garden of Eden? Land animals? Sky animals? Water animals? We are ready for the next question. We think. Wow, Kyle and Angie are better than the high score. It's amazing. We're ready for question number three. Question number three, what name did God give to the dry land that he created on day three? What name did God give to the dry land that he created on day three? Was that name earth or nature or universe or world? Is that earth, nature, universe, or world? We're ready for question number four. Question number four is, what was the name of the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden? Was it fig tree? Was it tree of life? Was it tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or was it vine tree? Pick your answer. What was the name of the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden? Fig tree? Tree of life? Tree of knowledge of good and evil? Vine tree? That was question number four. Whoa. Six-way tie. We're ready for question five. Question number five. Question five, what one particular land animal is named as being created on the sixth day in Genesis 1? What one particular land animal is named as being created on the sixth day in Genesis 1? Was it birds? Was it cattle? Was it horse? Was it whale? Birds? Cattle? Horse? Or whale? That's the first five questions. We are now going to the next five. These are questions all about Noah. Questions about Noah. Question number six. Who was Noah's father? Was it Abel or Enoch 
or Lamech or Seth? Pick your answer. Again, question six. Who was Noah's father? Was it Abel or Enoch or Lamech or Seth? Pick your answer. We're ready for question number seven. Question seven, which of these was not a son of Noah? Was it Canaan or Ham or Japheth or Seth? Which of these was not a son of Noah? Which of these was not a son of Noah? Canaan, Ham, Japheth, Seth. I think we have a problem with that one. It shouldn't be Seth, it should be Shem. Change the Seth to Shem, if it's not too late. Question number eight. Question number eight. How did the Lord destroy mankind in Noah's day? Was it by earthquake, or by famine, or by fire, or by flood? Again, how did the Lord destroy mankind in Noah's day? By earthquake, or famine, or fire, or flood? Pick your answer. Question number nine. Question number nine. What kind of wood did Noah use to build the ark? What kind, of Noah, uh, what kind of wood did Noah use to build the ark? Was it cedar or fir or gopher or oak? Again, what kind of wood did Noah use to, re, to build the ark? Cedar, fir, gopher, oak. That was question nine. Question number ten. A total of how many days and nights was Noah and his family inside that ark? Was it seven, or 40, or 150, or 360 plus? Again, a total of how many days and nights was Noah and his family inside the ark? Seven, or 40, or 150, or 360 plus? Pick your answer. We are now ready for the next five questions. These are all about Abraham, life of Abraham. Question number 11. In what land did Abraham live when God first called him? Was it Canaan or Egypt or Paden Aram or Ur? Pick your answer. In what land did Abram live when God first called him? Canaan, Egypt, Paden Aram? Or er. We're now ready for question number 12. Question number 12, when uh, we are first introduced to Abram, what was his wife's name? Was it Hagar, or Rachel, or Rebecca, or Sarai? Pick your answer. When we're first introduced to Abram, what was his wife's name? Hagar, or Rachel, or Rebecca, or Sarai? Question number 13, what was the name of Abram's first son by that wife that you just answered in the previous question? So what was the name of Abram's first son by that wife that we were first introduced to? Was that son's name Esau or Isaac or Ishmael or Jacob? Again, what was the name of Abram's first son by that wife, Esau or Isaac, or Ishmael, or Jacob. Next question, number 14. Which family member did Abram have so much strife with that he had to separate from him? Was it Abimelech, or Haran, or Lot, or Terah? Which family member did Abram have so much strife with that he had to separate from him? Abimelech. Haran, Lot, or Terah? And then question number 15. Question number 15. How many years old was Abraham when he died? Was he 110 years old? Or 120? Or 175? Or none of the above? Again, how many years old was Abraham when he died? 110? 120? 
or none of the above? Next question. Next question now is question number 16, and these next five questions are about the life of Joseph. Again, this is Joseph in the Old Testament book of Genesis. Question 16, what was the name of Joseph's father? Was it Abraham, or Heli, or Isaac, or Jacob? Pick your answer. What was the name of Joseph's father? Abraham, Heli, Isaac, or Jacob? Number 17, who was Joseph's oldest brother? Was it Benjamin, or Judah, or Levi, or Reuben? Pick your answer again. Who was Joseph's oldest brother? Benjamin, Judah, Levi, Reuben. Question number 18. For how many pieces of silver did Joseph's brothers sell him to a traveling caravan? Was it 10 pieces of silver, or 20, or 30, or 100? Pick your answer. How many pieces of silver did Joseph's brothers sell him to a traveling caravan? Was it 10, or 20, or 30, or 100? Question number 19. Question number 19. For which of the following did Joseph not interpret their dream? Was it the baker, or the butler, or Jacob, or Pharaoh? Again, which of the following did Joseph not interpret their dream? The baker, or the butler, or Jacob, or Pharaoh? And then question number 20. Question number 20 is, where was Joseph's dead bones finally buried? Was it in Canaan, or in Egypt, or in Haran, or in Mesopotamia? Pick your answer again. Where was Joseph's dead bones finally buried? Was it in Canaan, or Egypt, or Haran, or Mesopotamia? That is now the first 20 questions, and the rating so far. We have Ben has got the top spot there, followed by Zach and Phoebe are in second place, and Kyla and Angie is in third place. Again, I'm sure there's others playing it, but we're going to stop just for a moment. I want to give you the answers up to this point. For you that have a written piece of paper, real quickly, if they are correct, put a check mark on the right-hand side. If they are not correct, then you have to put an X. So we're going to go all the way from 1 uh, through number 20. And so let's get our answers here. Question number 1, uh, the answer is C, 6. Question number 2, the answer is B, land animals. Question number 3 is A, earth Question number four is C, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Question number five is B, cattle. Question number six is C, Lamech. Question number seven is, now I made a mistake in the question, so you might have to fix it. The answer should be A, Canaan. But also Seth would be a correct answer there. So if it's A, Canaan, or D, Seth, either one of those would be correct for you that Seth should have said Shem. And so that's number seven. Number eight is D, Flood. Number, number nine is C, Gopher. Number 10, how many days Noah in the ark? D, 360 plus. In fact, it was 370 that was uh, the days they were in. Number 11 is D, Ur. Number 12 is D, Sarai. Number 13 is B, Isaac. Number 14 is C, Lot. Number 15 is C, 175. Number 16 is D, Jacob. Number 17 is D, Reuben. Number 18 is B, 20. Number 19 is C, Jacob. Number 20 is A, Canaan. 
And let's get, uh, let's get number 21. New questions here now. Question number 21. These are all about the life of Moses. Question number 21. Into which of the 12 tribes of Israel was Moses born? Was he born into Benjamin's tribe or Judah or Levi or Reuben? Again, into which of the 12 tribes of Israel was Moses born? Benjamin or Judah or Levi or Reuben? Pick your answer. Number 22. After Moses was adopted into Egyptian life, what relationship did Moses have to Pharaoh? Was he a brother? Was he a father? Was he a grandson? Or was he a son? Again, after Moses was adopted into Egyptian life, what relationship did Moses have to Pharaoh? Brother, father, grandson, or son? Question number 23. To what land did Moses flee, spending his next 40 years there, before God called him to deliver the Jews? Was it Canaan that he fled to? Or Egypt that he fled to? Or Midian that he fled to? Or Palestine that he fled to? Again, to what land did Moses flee, spending his next 40 years there, before God called him to deliver the Jews? Canaan or Egypt or Midian or Palestine? Question number 24. On what mountain did God give Moses the Ten Commandments? Was that mountain Ararat? Or Moriah? Or Pisgah? Or Sinai? Pick your answer. Question, on what mountain did uh, God give Moses the Ten Commandments? Ararat, Moriah, Pisgah, or Sinai? And then question number 25, how many years old was Moses when he died? How many years old was Moses when he died? 40, 80, 120, 175. Pick your answer. How many years old was Moses when he died? 40, 80, 120, or 175? Now we're going to stop there because for you that have a paper, you're, these last five questions end at the front side, so let's quickly get these answers to finish off the front side. Question number 21 is C, Levi. Question number 22 is C, grandson. Question number 23 is C, Midian. Question number 24 is D, Sinai. Question number 25 is C, 120. And so you should now have the front side, if you're doing it on a piece of paper, on one of our blank forms, you should now have 25 answered and if on those answers, if you would just put a total out of 25, and apparently the total at this point is 24,000 on the computer. 24,000 on the computer. A great mystery there with 25 questions, but nonetheless, we will leave that alone. Question number 26. Question number 26, are you ready? What musical instrument could David play? Did he play the drum, or the flute, or the harp, or the organ? Again, question number 26. What musical instrument could David play? The drum, the flute, the harp, or the organ? Pick your answer. Question number 27. Question number 27. Which of the following two were father and son? Was it Jonathan and David, Saul and David, Saul and Jonathan, or Saul and Solomon? Again, which of the following two were father and son, Jonathan and David, Saul and David, Saul and Jonathan, Saul and Solomon? Pick your answer. Question number 28. We're now at the halfway point. Question number 28. Which of the following did David not kill? His own son? Bear? Giant? Or lion? Pick your answer. 
Which of the following did David not kill? His own son? Bear? Giant? Lion? Incidentally, all of these answers are in alphabetical order or numerical order. Question number 29. How many wives did David have? Was it zero? Or one to five? Or six to ten? Or 700 wives and 300 concubines? How many wives did David have? Was it zero? One to five? Six to ten? Or 700 wives and 200 concubines? Question number 30. Question number 30. By what means did David finally die? Was it by an arrow? By a spear? By a sword? Or by none of the above? By what means did David finally die? Arrow? Spear? Sword? Or none of the above? We're ready for question number 31. Incidentally, you can't use any cheats, can't use a Bible, can't use internet. Pastor, I couldn't get it fast enough even if I tried. The next five questions, 31 to 35, are all about the earthly life of Jesus. Question number 31, according to the Gospel of John and also 1 John, what was Jesus' heavenly name in eternity past? Was it Alpha? Was it Jesus? Was it Word? Or was it Yahweh? Again, according to the Gospel of John and also 1 John, what was Jesus' heavenly name in eternity past? Alpha, Jesus, Word, or Yahweh? Question number 32. Question number 32. How old was Jesus when he first asked questions of the temple doctors in Jerusalem? Was he eight days old? Forty days old? Twelve years old? Or about 30 years old? Again, how old was Joseph when he first asked questions of the temple, pe temple doctors in Jerusalem? Eight days old, 40 days old, 12 years old, about 30 years old. Question number 33. What secular earthly occupation did Jesus have before he began his earthly public ministry? Was he a carpenter or a fisherman or a teacher or a temple priest? Again, that's question number 33. What secular earthly occupation did Jesus have before he began his earthly public ministry? Was he a carpenter or a fisherman or a teacher or a temple priest? Question 34. Question 34. How many years long was Jesus' earthly public ministry? Was it zero to one year? One to two years long? Two to three years long? Or three to four years long. Again, how many years long was Jesus' earthly public ministry? Zero to one year long? One to two years long? Two to three years long? Three to four years long? Question number 35. Which of the following cities was not either Jesus' birthplace or his upbringing or where he died? So one of these here is not either Jesus' birthplace or upbringing or where he died. Was it Bethlehem or Capernaum or Jerusalem or Nazareth? Again, which of the following cities was not Jesus' birthplace or upbringing or where he died? Bethlehem, Capernaum, Jerusalem or Nazareth? We're ready for question 36. Just looking at the score real quick. Ben is at 34,000, Phoebe is at 33,000, Tisha, 32,000, and Boone, Daniel Boone, isn't that something? We're ready for number 36. 36 through 40, these questions are all about Calvary. They're all about Calvary. Question 36, what was the name of the other person who was made to carry Jesus' cross? Was it Joseph? Or Nicodemus? Or Peter? Or Simon? Again, what was the name of the other person who was made to carry Jesus' cross? Joseph? Nicodemus? Peter? Or Simon? Question number 37. Approximately how many hours was Jesus alive while he hung on that cross? 
three hours, six hours, nine hours, 12 hours? Pick your answer. Approximately how many hours was Jesus alive while he hung on that cross? Three hours, six hours, nine hours, 12 hours. Question number 38. Which one of the Jesus apostles was also at Calvary watching Jesus hang on that cross? Was it James or John or Judas or Peter? Again, number 38, which one of Jesus' apostles was also at Calvary watching Jesus hang on that cross? Was it James or John or Judas or Peter? Question number 39. Question 39, the sign that identified Jesus' crime that was nailed above on his cross was printed in how many languages? Was it in one language, two languages, three languages, four languages? Again, the sign that identified Jesus' crime that was also nailed on that cross was printed in how many languages? One language, two languages, three languages, four languages? Question number 40. What happened to the sky between 9 a.m. and 12 noon while Jesus hung on that cross? Did it burn up? Did it turn dark? Did it turn seven times brighter? Or it didn't change at all? Again, what happened to the sky between 9 a.m. and 12 noon while Jesus hung on that cross? Either it burned up or it turned dark or it turned seven times brighter or it didn't change at all. We're looking at our standings here. We've got Ben at 39,000, Phoebe and Tisha tied at 37,000, Obi at 36,000, and we just lost Daniel Boone. He's gone. Number 41. These questions are all about the life of Paul. The life of Paul. Question 41. What was the name of the city that Paul was born in? Was Paul born in Antioch or Damascus or Jerusalem or Tarsus? Again, what was the name of the city that Paul was born in? Antioch or Damascus or Jerusalem or Tarsus? Question number 42. What learned teacher did Paul get his early religious instruction under? Did he learn under Annas? or under Caiaphas, or under Gamaliel, or under John? What learned teacher did Paul get his early religious instruction under? Was it under Annas, or Caiaphas, or Gamaliel, or John? Question number 43. On Paul's journey to what city to persecute Christians there, did God stop him? And Paul got saved. Was it Antioch or Damascus or Jerusalem or Rome? Again, on Paul's journey to what city to persecute Christians there, did God stop him and Paul got saved? Was it on the way to Antioch or Damascus or Jerusalem or Rome? Question number 44, how many books of the New Testament can we safely give Paul the credit for humanly authoring? Again, how many books of the New Testament can we safely give Paul the credit for humanly authoring one to three books, six to nine books, 12 to 14 books, 16 to 18 books? How many books of the New Testament can we safely give Paul the credit for humanly authoring? One to three, six to nine, 12 to 14, 16 to 18. Question 45. Chronologically, what is the last book of the New Testament that Paul humanly authored before he died? Chronologically, what is the last book of the New Testament that Paul humanly authored before he died? Was it Romans or Philemon or Titus or 2 Timothy? Pick your answer. 
Now, so we don't get ourselves ahead of ourselves, we're going to back up. If you have a piece of paper, I'm going to quickly give you the answer so you can mark them. You got them right, put a check mark on the right-hand side column. If you got them wrong, put an X there. Number 26 is three, uh, sorry, C, harp. C harp. Number 27 is C, Saul and Jonathan. Number 28 is his own son. That's A, his own son. Number 29 is C, 6 to 10. Number 30 is D, none of the above. Number 31 is C, Word. In the beginning was the Word. His name was Word. Number 32 is C, 12 years old. Number 33 is A, Carpenter. Number 34 is three to four years. That's D, three to four years. Number 35 is B, Capernaum. Capernaum. Number 36 is D, Simon. Number 37 is B, six hours. Number 38 is B, John. Number 39 is C, languages. Number 40 is D. It didn't change at all. First three hours, Jesus was on the cross. That sky didn't change. Uh, number 41 is D, Tarsus. Number 42 is C, Gamaliel. Number 43 is B, Damascus. Number 44 is C, 12 to 14 books. Number 45 is D, 2 Timothy. We have 10 more questions. Question number 46, these next five have to do with the book of Revelation. So all these are about the book of Revelation, number 46. Who is the human author of the book of Revelation? Was it James or John or Paul or Peter? Again, who is the human author of the book of Revelation? Was it James or John or Paul or Peter? Number 47, how many different local churches were letters written to as recorded in Revelation 1, 2, and 3? Again, how many different local churches were letters written to as recorded in Revelation 1, 2, 3? Was it one local church, three local churches, seven local churches, or none of these answers? How many different local churches were letters written to as recorded in Revelation 1 to 3? One or three or seven or none of the answers. Question 48, which specific chapters in Revelation record events that take place during the seven-year tribulation? Again, which specific chapters in Revelation record events that take place during the seven-year tribulation? Is it Revelation 1, 2, 3? Or Revelation 4 through 12? Or Revelation 4 through 19? Or Revelation 20 through 22? Which specific chapters in Revelation record events that take place during the seven-year tribulation, Revelation 1 to 3? Or chapters 4 to 12? Or chapter 4 to 19? Or chapter 20 through 22? Question number 49. What is the name of the book that's mentioned seven times in Revelation that we want our name in? Is it the book of life? The book of rewards? the book of sins, or the book of works. Again, what's the name of the book that's mentioned seven times in Revelation that we want our name in? The book of life, the book of rewards, the book of sins, the book of works. And then question 50. What word appears 19 times in Revelation 1 to 3 and then isn't mentioned again until Revelation 22? Is it the word church or churches? Is it God? Is it heaven? Is it Jesus? Again, what word appears 19 times in Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3, and then isn't mentioned again until Revelation 22? Is it church? Is it God? Is it heaven? Is it Jesus? We have five more questions. These last questions are just general questions about the Bible. Now, I don't want you to race off because I know that many of you might have 100%, but uh, we have a gift for everybody that is in the top group. We'll tell you what that is. We have a can of pop that we want to give you. It's Christmas pop. You see, why is it Christmas pop? Because you can drink it around Christmas. 
And so if you earn this can of pop, honestly, before you leave, just like last week we had a curbside pickup by that first window of the new fellowship hall, we want you to head that way, get a can of pop, and we will get it to you. Hopefully we'll get the flavor that you want. I will be out there to hand it to you. Last five questions. Now let's get up the answers for 46 to 50. If you have a piece of paper, here are your answers so you know whether you got it right or not. 46, B, John. 47 is C, 7. 48 is C, Revelation 4 through 19. 49 is A, Book of Life. And 50 is church or churches. That's an A. Last five questions. Question number 51. How many separate books make up our King James Bible? Is it seven books? 27 books? 39 books? Or 66 books? Again, how many separate books make up our King James Bible? Seven, 27, 39, 66. Question 52. Which man is credited for authoring the most books in the Old Testament? Which man is credited for authoring the most books in the Old Testament? John, Moses, Paul, Solomon. Again, which man is credited for authoring the most books in the Old Testament? John, Moses, Paul, Solomon. Question 53. How many verses are in the shortest chapter in our Bible? Are there, is there one verse in the shortest chapter of the Bible? Two verses, three verses, five verses again. How many verses are in the shortest chapter in our Bible? Is it one verse, two verses, three verses, five verses? Question 54. How many verses are in the longest chapter in our Bible? 66 verses, 76 verses, 176 verses, 198 verses. Again, how many verses are in the longest chapter in our Bible? 66, 76, 176, and 198. And finally, the last question, number 55. You thought we'd never get here. Question number 55. Which of the following is not mentioned as a location in eternity? Now, this is not mentioned. Is it the new earth or the new heaven? or the new Jerusalem, or the new world. Again, which of the following is not mentioned as a location in eternity? Is it the new earth, or new heaven, or new Jerusalem, or new world? Pick your answer. Whoa. Ben is in first place, 54,000. Obi is in the next place at 51,000. Phoebe is at 50,000 and tied that with Tisha at 50,000. Let me give you the answers for these last five. 51 is D, 66. 52 is B, Moses. 53 is B, 2. Psalm 117 has two verses in that chapter. 54 is C, 176. And 55 is D, new world. There is a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, but not a new world. On the back side of that sheet, there were 30 additional questions. And so if you add real quickly down the back side, you get a total of 30. If you'll add your total of 30 from the back side with a total of 25 from the front side, that gives you a final score of 55 and I wonder if uh, anyone got all of those answers. If you got all those answers in the parking lot, Ben's going to look out the window. Would you put your four-way flashers on if somebody in your car got all the answers right? Can you see four-way flashers? He is looking for them. Can't see it. He's not wanting because he wants to be first place. Brother Mickey is going to come and sing one verse of Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, 
then he is going to close the service in prayer. And when he does that, again, if you got 53, 54, 55 answers, then we want you to drive. I'll tell you what, if you got 51 or above correct answers, would you just drive by that new fellowship hall window? I'm going to pass you out a pop for a gift. Again, Brother Mickey's going to lead one verse of Amazing Grace then he is going to close in prayer. I'm going to quickly get outside to hand out this pop. All right, I'm sure you won't need the, uh, the number in your hymn book, but it's 244 for Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now 